I want to share one simple truth with you tonight. If you have a Bible here, open to Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah chapter 29. I titled the message tonight, Life Isn't Like a Minecraft World. Life is not like a Minecraft world. Minecraft came out as a video game, and at first uh, it was purchased by Microsoft in 2014. It's been around uh, many years before that, in 2002, 2003, and some variations. And right now, Minecraft, the game, video game Minecraft, is the second most popular game still in the world. Number one is Tetris. I know some of the older folks were like, it has to be Pac-Man. I know it's Pac-Man, but Pac-Man did not make the list. I'm sorry. But how many of you kids have ever played Minecraft before? Should I ask the adults how many adults have played Minecraft before? I probably do not want to know that question, the answer to that question. It was developed by a single person, and on any given month, 91 million people will play Minecraft right now in 2019. That is more, that is more than the population in France, the United Kingdom, Italy, or South Korea playing one game, Minecraft. This comes close to home because my boys have played and still sometimes play the game called Minecraft. In Minecraft, you have a little character, and he's just a little boxy character. There'll probably be a picture up on the screen here uh, coming up here pretty quick on the Minecraft screen for those of you who don't know what it looks like. And in this particular game, you build things inside this world. The world is, is basically a nothing space. You begin to take these blocks, and you can build houses, and you can have sheep and cows and things like that, and build doors that don't go anywhere. I mean, that's kind of a cool house, you know? A door opens to a block wall. I mean, that'd be the way I construct things. And, uh, and when you get bored, you can start all over again. You can do this over and over and over and over and over and over again and over again. I begin to think as I came to this tonight to this service how that sometimes we think life is like a Minecraft game. How sometimes we, we wish that we could build it over and over. And I want to give us three quick points. If you have your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 29, and in Jeremiah chapter 29 we'll look at verse 11, 12, and 13. The Bible says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you, and ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. Let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Lord, I thank you for loving us. Lord, I thank you for the time we have tonight. Lord, I pray for your help and your blessing. Lord, help our hearts to be open and listen clearly to your gospel. Lord, help us to understand how much you love us. Lord, and what you have in store for us if we trust in you. Lord, I pray in these next few brief moments you'd quiet all the distractions that could enter here. Lord, we pray that you'd get the honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 29, life is in a Minecraft world. Video games have taken quite a, a toll on society. And the fact is, with arcades and the current usage, um, they say it's a, it's a real-world problem. It's, it's a real-world problem that we have that people waste their time with video games. And they'll lament the fact, and they'll, yet they'll still come out tomorrow with another one, another one, another one. I would submit to you tonight, though, that the problem is not typically the video game. The problem is our outlook on life. And too often I would propose that we submit or, or submit that we treat our life like a mind-craft world. I remember early on my boys were making something. They said, Dad, look at this. And they made a gigantic roller coaster. This roller coaster went probably a thousand feet in the air, it seemed like, and we'd ride the roller coaster. And then they said, look, Dad, and they blew the whole thing up. That's a good boy thing to blow things up, apparently. And uh, my daughter, she said, oh, look, Dad, here, here's my horse that I have. What does a horse do? He eats grass. <laughs> that was a stupid question I asked. What else does a horse do? No, that's it. They just, eat, they just eat grass. But I want to submit three thoughts for you tonight of how my life is not like a Minecraft world. The first thought is this. My life is not like a Minecraft world because the plan is not up to me. The plan is not up to me. See, part of the allure of Minecraft, they say, I don't know, but they say, is that you can do whatever you want to do. You get to be in charge. You can make your house look just like you like. You can make the animals do just what you want. It is all up to you. 
when we always have that same thought in our life that we want to make up what we want to do. We want to live our own life, live our own plan. But the Bible tells us that the plan is not up to me. The Bible says that God has a plan for me. That's what this verse says. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Boy, God, God's thoughts for me are their big thoughts. God loves me. God wants to take me to heaven when I die. Before I was even born, God loved me. See, the plan is not up to me. I can look out in the world and I can see God's love. The Bible says how that even the rain is shown by God's grace. You look up during the rain or after the rain, and often you'll see a rainbow in the sky given to us by God. We can see symbols of God's love all around us or expressions of God's love. But God has a very specific plan for me. See, sometimes people say, well, my plan is this. I'm going to grow up here. I'm going to go to this college. I'm going to have this career. I'm going to marry this person and live the American dream. Make this amount of money every year and have two and a half kids and have, uh, and have three cars and four vacation homes. And that's the American dream. And, and then when they don't hit that American dream, they feel strangely uh, unsatisfied. I only had two kids, not two and a half. I only had two cars, not three. And I never quite did get my, my vacation home. And while those things aren't bad, I have to remember and understand from the Bible that the plan is not up to me. You know, the Bible tells me that God loves me. The Bible tells me that at some point I'm going to die. Everybody is going to die. The Bible says it's pointed unto man once to die after that the judgment. But God has a plan because he knew that there was a problem you see, because, because of sin in my life, and the Bible says in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned. That means that everyone has done something that God has said not to do. You may be familiar with the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are along the lines of thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. Most of us are familiar or know some of the Ten Commandments, and while well, hopefully we've not broken all of them, hopefully you've not killed somebody, the fact is, we've all broken some of them. I think if we're honest, we'd have to say, you know what? I've told a lie before. I, I've not been truthful. Maybe someone would say, you know what? I've taken something. I've stolen something that's not, that, that wasn't mine. I've broken a commandment. No, but, but the Bible tells me that, that because of that sin, that I can't go to heaven. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That word means to miss the mark. Some of you men in here are hunters. I'm not a big hunter. I uh, used a bow a long time ago, but I wasn't a very good shot at, with a bow and arrow. I had to shoot left-handed. But some of you in here, I've seen you, you're excellent with a bow and arrow. And that verse says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means that when I come short of the glory of God, I miss the mark of God's glory. That mark is heaven. And no matter what I do, I can't hit that mark and get to heaven all by myself. But God has a plan for me. He sent his son Jesus to die for me. The Bible says in Romans 5, 8, but God commended, he showed his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died for me, and he died for you. You see, God has a plan for me. And the Bible says in Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, God not only, not only has a plan for me, God has a future for me. And that future looks like life in heaven, and maybe you've heard of heaven before, but it is a beautiful place. It's where God is at. There's a there are things up there. There's a city up there with, you know, with gates made out of a, a huge pearl, and there's rubies. And, and in that city, their streets are paved with gold, the new heaven and the new earth. God has a future for me. But the Bible says, that I just quoted Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. And sometimes we want to say, well, I want to live my life like a Minecraft world. I want to make my own future. And I think I can go to heaven if I'm really good. But remember, the plan's not up to me. And if I get baptized at, at this church, then I'll go to heaven, but the plan's not up to me. It's up to God. And, and, and when I stand before God one day, it, it'll weigh my good works and my bad works, and, and hopefully my good works will outweigh my bad works. And The problem is the Bible doesn't say that. You see, God has a plan and God has a future. 
And the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. But Jesus died for us. You see, God wants me to live eternally in heaven with him. And by trusting him, I can do that. You see, the Bible not only has a plan for me, the second thought is this, building a lot doesn't mean anything. Now, when you play the game Minecraft, uh, you, know, you can build and build and build and build and build. You can build as many houses as you want. You can build into the ground and have lava. You can build and build and build anything. And, and eventually, there are some people I hear that have just massive worlds that they have built block by block by block. And others say, wow, that looks successful. And strangely enough, that's often how we judge this life. We judge success by what someone has built. And that person is successful because they have a lot of money, or that person is successful because they appear to be happy. They appear to be happy. And in Minecraft, you can build and build and build. In life, you can work and work and work, and you can play and play and play, and you can sleep and sleep and sleep. But building a lot doesn't mean anything. You see, the Bible says in Mark chapter 8, verse 36, For what doth it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul. What is a prophet? The Bible gives the answer, nothing. See, it doesn't matter how much <clears throat> I build. Request for me. And his request is to call upon him. The Bible says that if I call upon him, he says, if you call unto me and I will answer you, the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. His request is that I call upon him and ask him to save me. It doesn't matter what I build. It matters upon who I call. God has a request for me to call upon him. And God has an answer for me. If I seek him, I will find him. You see, the plan is not up to me. And it and, uh, doesn't matter how much I build. But the last thought tonight is this. There are no redos in life. There are no redos in life. Years ago, when I was a teenager, there was a game out called Contra. Some of you obviously played that who are old like myself. Contra began the game with three lives, and after three lives, you had to start over again. Except there was a cheat. There was this code, and someone's already saying it. It was up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, B-A, select, select, start. Actually called Konami code is the actual nerve for, for you nerds out there. That's what it's called, which I guess apparently I'm one since I know the name of that. A little known fact for those of you who are nerds, it actually worked on other devices as well. There used to be phones if you just would type that in and then hit enter, it would actually unlock the phone to developer mode. But just a side note for you. But many games, or most games, have redos, don't they? I didn't pass that level so I can do it again, and do it again, and do it again, and do it again, until you check the controller across the room, you don't do it any longer. And you wish sometimes that life would have a redo, but there's no redo in life. Hebrews says it's appointed to man once to die, but after this the judgment. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Isaiah 55, verse 6, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. You see, I wish there were redos in life. But there's not. We have one life to live. One opportunity. We can either live it for the Lord or live it for ourselves. We can choose to follow God or we can choose to follow something out. But, but the Bible says, Jesus says, Him that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. Jesus has never turned any single person away. He's always accepted everyone who has come to Him. You see, God has a plan for you. God has a future for you. But God has a home for you. And here at First Baptist Church, as a pastor, I want you to know that God loves you a whole bunch. 
The Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And we want you to know that God loves you so much that he sent his son, Jesus, to die for you. And Jesus lived around 2,000 plus years ago. He lived a perfect and a sinless life. He never made a single mistake. He was the son of God, and as that, he was all God and all man. He never said anything to his parents that he shouldn't say. He never took anything that he shouldn't take. And he never had a thought that he shouldn't have. He lived a sinless life. At the end of that life, they crucified him on a cross. The Bible teaches us that when he was crucified, he died on the cross to pay for the sins of the world. See, the Bible says for the wages of sin is death, but the Bible teaches us that Jesus died for us. He paid for our sins because he was perfect. He could pay for sins because he was the son of God. He could pay for everybody's sins. The Bible says that if we call upon him, like I mentioned, he will not cast us out. He will save us. You know, it's easy to call upon the Lord. The Bible uses the illustration of a gift. I happen to love gifts. But I've learned something about gifts. They have to be received. Someone can bring me a gift and say, here, Pastor Howell, here's a gift for you. And if I look at that gift and, and don't take it, it's still not my gift yet, though it may have my name on it. And they could push it out and say, here, take it, take it, take it. Eventually, what I would have to do is take that gift. And some have asked, well, how do I take the gift from God? Does God give me a box? Well, no. The Bible teaches us that if we call upon him, in the name of the Lord, we shall be saved. It was years ago that a young man, that a man gave his son a gift. The son had asked for, for a car, but instead his dad gave him a book. The, old, the son was bitter, angry, stormed out, said, I want this stupid book. But strangely did not throw the book away. From that point on, the son was estranged from his father because of that perceived slight. For years, did not speak to him. Eventually, his father was on his deathbed and, and then passed. After the father passed, as the story goes, the son was in remorse and opened the book that he'd received so many years earlier, having never opened it. Inside the cover, I said, son, this book I'll help you in life. And then a certificate that said, and by the way, go down to this dealership and get a brand new car. You see, God comes to us with his book called the Bible. And this Bible tells us of Jesus and how he died for us. But if we don't accept that gift, we'll never get it. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the gift of eternal life you give to us. But I pray you'd help us now as we're in this time, to be honest, I wonder with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, no one's looking around except for me. Maybe tonight, as I was speaking, the Lord touched your heart. Maybe you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. You know, it's not hard. The Bible compares it to eating a piece of bread or drinking a cup of water. Those are easy things. Often here at, at church will help someone accept Christ as their Savior. And often it goes something like this. We can lead someone in a prayer. It's not in the prayer that saves you. It's in the heart that belief is made. And often we'll have someone pray a simple prayer like this. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to pay for my sin. But I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. Please save me and take me to heaven. I trust in Jesus. And I wonder with that, I wonder if tonight, if you've never prayed that, never asked Jesus to save you, I wonder if you would do that tonight. In just a moment, I'm going to repeat that prayer just like you heard that. I would say that maybe in your heart right now, the Holy Spirit is saying something like this. You need to do that. You've never asked Jesus to save you. 
And I wonder if in just a moment when I repeat that, if you'd pray that and mean that from your heart, with our heads bound or eyes closed, if you've never asked Jesus to save you, I wonder if you'd pray right now and ask Christ to save you. Say this, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Tell him that. Tell him from your heart. Tell him, I know I deserve to pay for my sin. But I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. Please save me and take me to heaven. I trust in Jesus and him alone. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I wonder if you would say, you know what, Pastor Howell? I just prayed that and I meant that from my heart. I never prayed it before, but I just prayed that. And as a testimony to that, I'm going to slip my hand up. I prayed that just now. I've never prayed that before, but I just prayed that and I asked Jesus to save me. And I want to let you know that and just slip your hand up, slip it right back down. I'll acknowledge it. Amen. I see that. Who else? Amen. I see that. Who else? I just prayed that and I meant that. I just prayed that and I, amen. I see that. Amen. Who else? I just prayed that prayer. I just asked Jesus to save me. Who else? 